Welcome everybody to the Nexus in Action. This is the latest in the UNDP's development dialogues aimed at rethinking solutions to crisis in the decade of action. I'm your moderator, Henry Bonsu, and I'm going to be the nexus between you and our esteemed speakers as we consider the opportunities and challenges in scaling up more integrated ways of doing things. And the need for scaling up is real. You have long-term displacement within and across borders, deep poverty and inequality, newer threats brought on by climate change, conflict, and food insecurity. And then you can add to that the massive disruption of the global pandemic, and you can see why it's more urgent than ever for humanitarian, development, and peace actors to collaborate, coordinate, and recalibrate their respective roles. But how do humanitarians sharpen their efforts on crisis response and life-saving life assistance communities while enabling the longer-term approaches of development and peace specialists? How do the latter stay and deliver when crises hit? How do they focus on the needs of the most vulnerable people while targeting the shocks that can set back hard-won development gains? And what are the challenges and the dilemmas of mindset, core principles, identity, and risk tolerance that present themselves to organizations used to doing things a certain way? You know what I mean when I say that. So lots of questions, but I'm confident we're going to get some answers from our speakers, who include specialists from the UNDP, WFP, ICRC, and Oxfam. So we'll start this session. It's about a 90-minute session by looking at some practical dilemmas through two countries, Myanmar and Madagascar, so two perspectives there. Then we'll have a chain reaction panel in which our speakers will talk to each other, sort of interview style, in sequence about some of the most challenging aspects of operating and collaborating. And finally, you'll be able to react to what you've seen and heard in our Q&A, and that'll be the final 20 minutes to half hour of the session. So let's frame this, let's set the context by looking at Myanmar and Madagascar through the eyes of two UNDP resident representatives, and they will outline the value of opportunities for and challenges around implementing Nexus approaches. Very technical sounding, but we're gonna be, be as practical as possible. And in a few minutes, uh, Natasha Van Rin will talk about Madagascar. But first, let's welcome Titon Mitra, who is resident representative in Myanmar. Now, Titon's worked in the development field for over 30 years. He's held senior positions for the UN in the Philippines, in Iraq, amongst others, and in his home nation of Australia with AusAid. And when he was Global Emergency Director for Care International, so I'm delighted to welcome Titon Mitra. Titon, it's over to you. Give us your perspective. Aha, I think we're having an issue with Titan's um, connection there. So we're going to go uh, to um, Natasha, who is going to talk to us about Madagascar. So Natasha Van Ridden, of course, um, if we can get Titan back, then we will do. So Natasha, I'll just say a little bit about her. She brings with her also a wealth of experience gathered in uh, Yemen, Central African Republic, Burundi and Timor-Leste. A variety of senior roles ranging from team leader in peace support operations to country advisor in political affairs, as in the African division. And last October, she was appointed UNDP resident representative for Madagascar. And Natasha, you're gonna to talk to us, I hope, about the challenges and opportunities that you and your colleagues and partners face there. Natasha Van Rijn, over to you. Hi, and thank you very much, uh, Henry, for that introduction. Um, I won't introduce myself again, but I'll uh, take a couple of minutes of everybody's time to maybe talk a little bit about uh, the context of Madagascar and the, the challenges and opportunities related to uh, applying Nexus approaches in the Malagasy context. Um, Madagascar, as I'm sure most people in the call or the, the, the event know, is that uh, it is a least developed country. It's not dealing with open conflict um, as in some other contexts, but it has known waves of political instability uh, linked mostly to electoral cycles in this country. Um, the instability that's seen here in combination with other risks and stresses 
including droughts, migration, demographic change, are having a negative impact, obviously, on economic growth and on human development. It's a country that's dealing with multi-dimensional drivers of fragility that we see in other crisis-affected contexts, um, but they're particularly acute in the Kansud region or in the southern region of Madagascar. Um, with a population of approximately 27 million people on the island, Madagascar is ranked 156 out of 189 countries on the human development ranking in 2020. Um, as is the case in many other least developed countries, the COVID pandemic has obviously had a very significant impact uh, on uh, the population uh, here in, in Madagascar. So along with uh, environmental related challenges, Madagascar is faced with a, a considerable number of governance challenges related specifically to weak decentralization leading to regional inequalities and lack of basic social service provision. There are significant infrastructure deficits, uh, specifically in the south of the country, which I'll come back to, and high levels of corruption and elite capture. Uh, Madagascar, as is, is mostly known for hosting 5% of the world's biodiversity. Um, but it also means that this country has been quite hard hit by climate change and its implications. Uh, again, most especially in the south, where the, the southern part of the country is experiencing the most acute drought it's experienced since 1981. Uh, since 2009, the Sud, as we call it, has been hit with back-to-back -back droughts, forcing people to resort to negative coping mechanisms um, and fairly desperate survival measures, such as eating locusts, raw red cactus fruits and wild leaves to survive. The agricultural sector and the water tables in the region are particularly hard hit. Uh, to the point where uh, nearly two in every five people in the cost suit, which is made up of over a million people, are severely food insecure. And five districts have been recently um, classified in the IPC categorization as being in a merge. Uh, one particular district, uh, there's 75% of the population which is severely food insecure and 14,000 people have been uh, classified as being in IPC5, which is, in other words, famine, uh, living in famine conditions. So families as a result of this are leaving their rural homes and heading towards cities for survival. And uh, since the beginning of 2021 this year, we've seen a significant uh, amount of displacement to uh, regional cities, uh, creating not only protection risks, um, but we're also learning that there are risks of further displacement as the year rolls on. So at the same time as this fairly uh, serious uh, humanitarian situation is unfolding, there are also significant security risks in the region linked to what we call the Dahalo gangs. Um, this is, in other words, cattle rustling which is, is taking place also, again, most predominantly in the South, endangering lives and livelihoods um, and limiting access uh, to, to, for vulnerable pop populations to, to basic social services. Most recently in Madagascar, we saw an attack, a Dahalo attack in a region called Medongisu uh, South, where up to 300 Dahalo or cattle rustlers uh, a a challenge the National Defence Forces, leading to uh, the death of two soldiers and several dozen civilians uh, killed. So it's a, there's a serious uh, security uh, peace element taking place in the same region. So in the south of Madagascar specifically, all the elements of climate change, hunger-inducing drought, the Dahalo phenomenon, the increasing population movements and the longer-term structural questions that are linked to governance, decentralization, state presence, um, are combining to create a specific subnational context where the need to strengthen nexus approaches is critical. Uh, in order to deal not only with the immediate term uh, needs, but also the longer term and ongoing structural uh, drivers of, of what is taking place there today. So it provides, Southern Madagascar provides the 
the not only the UN system but the international community and the the state uh, an opportunity to uh, look at how an HDP nexus approach can inform clear operational and programmatic actions that uh, tackle a multi-sectoral problem with uh, multi-sectoral solutions um, in a more integrated way. Um, last year's drought in the south of Madagascar reveals in particular a lack of concerted and coordinated approaches from the government, but also its technical partners to avert the, the occurrence of um, the crisis that we're seeing today. Some estimate that in the past five years, up to $2.8 billion have been invested in the south of Madagascar, but yet we're finding ourselves uh, again in uh, a negative cycle of uh, humanitarian um, response. So in order to address some of this, uh, this system in, in uh, Madagascar is working on three levels. The first one I would say is that there has been a flash appeal in, for the south of Madagascar in January 2021. This is clearly humanitarian action that's been undertaken in partnership with the government and to date that's been 70% uh, funded. Uh, the Peace Building Fund also runs programs in the south of Madagascar and it aims to address some of the social cohesion questions linked specifically to the Dahalo phenomenon that I respond, uh, that I made reference to earlier. And finally, in the development uh, pillar, there is a lot of work underway uh, to support the, the updating and the activation of what we call the Stratégie Intégrée de Développement du Consul, which is the integrated development strategy of the region. And this document helps to bring partners together to look at some of the more critical issues around uh, infrastructure, long-term economic development, um, and, and how to support economic sectors to grow. So I'll keep it short, but to, to maybe point to two or three issues with regard to the nexus um, and applying nexus approaches in the South. We have opportunities uh, and based on what I would say is a fairly common analysis across the board on what the issues are in the South of Madagascar. And uh, so there we, I think, have an increased opportunity based on that common analysis to refine our understanding, coordinate further, take into consideration the environmental uh, angle, which isn't necessarily featuring heavily in the triple nexus conversation, but needs to, at least in the case of Southern Madagascar. And finally, to look at financing and how we can come more closely together to, to address what are multi-sectoral and definitely multi-pillar uh, questions. So let me stop there for now. Natasha, thank you very much. Yeah, multi-sectoral and multi-pillar um, uh, questions. I mean, <laughs> I, I might say in my uh, broadcasting, well, that's an understatement, and given what you've given us over the past uh, few minutes or so, huge array of issues and uh, challenges which really need that nexus approach now. We're going to move from Madagascar to Myanmar, and uh, let's try and uh, reach Tita Mitra. I believe he's standing by. He is a resident representative in that country, and he's worked in the development field for over 30 years. So, Titan, uh, let's hear your perspective. What's happening there, and how is the Nexus approach helping? What are the challenges? Over to you. Thanks, Henry, and thanks for the opportunity to speak at this uh, dialogue. And I have to say the first Nexus challenge is actually getting the Nexus between myself and this uh, dialogue, but I uh, hope right, right. you will ask while I'm here. So, so just, um, uh, just conscious of the time, so let me be fairly brief. I'd just like to outline the context in uh, Myanmar, uh, some of the challenges and opportunities and some broad, broad observations. So firstly, in terms of the context, um, the coup of 1st February really caught us all by surprise in one sense, but in strangely enough, we should have anticipated it. Let's see if um, it can be reestablished. Uh, Teton has gone, he's been plunged into darkness. We call it Dumsa Dumsa in Ghana, that means lights on and off. But that kind of highlights exactly uh, what the issues are. I mean, one of the key problems in the countries under consideration is infrastructure, you know, 
that's the issue. I mean, if you haven't got a viable infrastructure, whether it's lights, electricity, roads, uh, transport, then how can you uh, scale up anything? How can you move from a least developed to a middle income country and then a highly developed country, which is a pathway uh, all countries want to be on? Okay, if we can get Titan back uh, to talk about Myanmar, then of course we will, because there is still some time. But now, um, I did promise a chain reaction panel. Some of you will never have witnessed one of these before, so um, I think you're going to like the way we do this. We've got four participants who bring a lot of experience, especially in the areas of external engagement with uh, partners. Uh, let me uh, tell you who they are. One is Hugh McLeman, who's a program specialist at the UNDP, based in Geneva, and he focuses on the relationship with the humanitarian system and strengthening the UNDP's nexus offer and their approaches to working with humanitarian and peace actors. We've also got Philippa Schmitz Guinote, who is policy advisor in the Policy and Humanitarian Diplomacy Division of the International Committee of the Red Cross, it's also based in Geneva. We've got Rebecca Richards, Chief of the Peace and Conflict Team of the World Food Program. I believe it's probably based in Rome, Rebecca. She's got many years' experience, over 20 years' experience uh, in the field and, of course, in policy. And we have Marta Valdez Garcia, who is Deputy Humanitarian Director of Oxfam and Co Chair of IASC, that's the Standing Committee Results Group 4. Um, so, all experts in their field, in policy, in, um, they know their own silos, they know how to stay in their lane, but they know the importance of working the nexus. So, let me uh, invite them on. It's going to be Hugh and Philippa, first of all. So let me hand it over to you as soon as you're up and we'll hear what you two have to say and then you will do the chain reaction panel. So this is the Nexus in Action, opportunities and challenges in scaling up Nexus approaches. Okay, Hugh and Philippa, over to you. Thanks very much, Henry, and, and thanks for having us here. Uh, shame not to hear from Teton, but I think it, it demonstrates the, the challenging environments that we work in. And I think uh, both Teton and Natasha's uh, uh, grounding of this conversation is super useful. So as Henry said, for the next uh, half an hour or so, we're going to have what's called a chain reaction panel, where we dig deeper into some of these uh, challenges of implementing a nexus approach. And, I, and I'd just like to say that uh, the, the people on this panel, we know each other very well. We, we probably speak to each other maybe weekly um, and coming from ICRC, from UNDP, uh, from Oxfam, um, and from WFP, um, we, I think we probably are the nexus in action in a way. So, uh, so, so maybe this is more a glimpse into the sorts of conversations we have rather than a, than a panel discussion. But Philippa, that leads me into to maybe sort of the first uh, issue that would be good to dig down into. And we heard there about the need for us to work together in these sorts of contexts in, in the Grand Sud in, in, in Madagascar and hopefully if Teton comes back in, in, in uh, Myanmar. What do you think some of the key differences are that exist between our, our agencies, between our mandates, between our priorities, uh, the principles that we that we use in our approaches? And do they work? I mean, are they are they fit for purpose? Do they do they is this what they look like in reality? Thanks, Hugh, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, this, this question of, of the differences in mandates and roles and priorities, uh, I mean, I should preface by saying that what I'll bring is a humanitarian perspective on this. Um, and we need to acknowledge, um, I think, that some of these uh, differences are sometimes oversimplified and, and sometimes even caric caricaturized. Um, but that's also part of the Nexus discussion. Uh, we, we can't discard that. Um, it's what makes some of the policy and practice of the Nexus sometimes a little bit challenging. So at the risk of uh, simplifying, oversimplifying and caricaturizing things, um, I'd say there's, there's a number of differences between our mandates, approaches and principles. Obviously, uh, some of the most commonly known and referred to are around time frame and speed. Uh, humanitarian action is short-term development. Um, is long-term uh, and more permanent, more durable. Um, differences around scale of activities, um, so humanitarian action being primarily operating at an individual and household level, while development is more looking at system-wide issues, whole-of-country approaches. Differences around um, principles and the relationship with the state. 
Um, so development uh, being grounded on the principle of, of government ownership, um, and that's naturally then reflecting reflected in, in planning and programming processes, um, and humanitarian action being grounded on, on principles of neutrality, impartiality, um, and independence, and so not driven by one actor, but by, by needs only. Um, there's a reason why these principles are, are, are different. Um, development is, is conceived primarily for a scenario of consensus, of relative stability. And so it makes sense that governments play obviously a, a very leading role, while humanitarian action, in particular in conflict affected areas, is conceived for scenarios of fragmentation, of division, of instability. And so these principles of neutrality, independence, are in a way tools that help us navigate those divisions and those, those scenarios so that we can engage with all sides, so that we can reach uh, people on, on all sides and not leave people behind. Um, so all of these differences are reflected in the way that we work, our planning processes, our financing tools, and so forth. Um, but they're, they're commonly... Uh, seen as, as, as differences that uh, define us, but not, not all of them, I would say, uh, stand the test of, of reality, or at least not entirely. So for instance, if you look at the, uh, at the COVID pandemic last, last year, we saw what was actually a, an emergency response from the development side. There was debt relief immediately. That was um, governments releasing emergency financial uh, measures to deal with the secondary impacts that were already starting to be felt. Um, and so that happened quite quickly. Uh, while at the same time, on the humanitarian side, we saw uh, some, some dividends to some extent of past previous uh, humanitarian activities that had been done a long time ago with a resilience rationale, already forward looking, and that proved useful then when this new crisis hit. Uh, so, for instance, um, a hospital in Lebanon that the ICRC had been um, supporting uh, during the Syrian crisis when there was a large influx of, of refugees that were putting pressure on, on the hospital. So we worked with the, um, the, 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 the health services to um, in, uh, strengthen the, the emergency capacity. And that, uh, everything, all, that investment then also paid off uh, when, when COVID hit. Uh, so there goes your distinction around time frames and short term, long term emergency um, and, uh, and, and this idea that humanitarian uh, outputs are very transient and don't, don't have long term dividends. Similarly, when you look at protracted conflicts and um, conflicts that happen in urban areas, which is happening more and more often, there, as a humanitarian actor, you're immediately in the middle of a system of systems, sometimes with large scale infrastructure, very sophisticated infrastructure. And so you may need to, to, uh, to work on an individual uh, small scale basis, but ultimately uh, to have an effective response um, quite quickly into a crisis, you need to think about that, that, serve, that system and how you can hold things in, in, in place. Um, and with respect to the relationship with the state, that's another one that sometimes do doesn't stand the, the, the test of reality. Uh, there's often this idea that humanitarians, uh, by being, uh, because of the principles, don't engage with the state, when in fact we do uh, all the time, from uh, the government commissioner in a remote area somewhere who uh, people go to with all their, their needs and, um, and problems, to line ministries, uh, there, is, there is an engagement. The difference is that we don't engage exclusively uh, with governments. We, 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 engage, we engage with all, uh, with all sides. So uh, I guess it's important to understand the logic and the history behind these differences, uh, challenge them where it's healthy to do so, for instance, around these timeframes, um, and preserve where it needs to be preserved. For instance, seeing humanitarian principles as actually an added value to be able to reach people when, when the context is, is very divided. So I guess bottom line, look at the differences, um, not as things that keep us apart, but I think you're a little bit frozen, Philip. But maybe, maybe, maybe let me pick up from there a little bit. I think I think this distinction you're making between between our differences defining us and and actually thinking about the differences and and principles and approaches as as just different tools that we have that we can combine in different ways to to actually work together to to meet needs and and and, and end needs. I think is a is a 
is a really interesting distinction because I think a lot of people think of principles as 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 this immutable sort of set of rules. But uh, thinking of them as tools, I think, is a really interesting approach. But even if we do that, we're still struggling to to make this work on the ground. We're still struggling to to see what it looks like in practice. So, do you, do you think that's more of a a uh, problem around the processes that we have, or or is it a mindset shift? I would say it's both. Um, it's both really because um, on the mindset side, um, we could uh, we could collaborate a lot more to get better at what we do. Uh, by this, I don't mean um, UNDP becoming a humanitarian organization or the ICRC becoming a development organization, but both our organizations being able to adapt operationally to the needs, to the situation um, that, and, and the people they're, they're, uh, they're trying to support, um, knowing that those needs evolve over time. Um, and here, I think there's something that's often underrated in the nexus, which is um, knowledge exchange. Um, all the dialogue and the work that goes into transferring perspectives and methodologies from one sector to the other, adapting them, all of that is going on actually um, uh, on multiple uh, scales and mu multiple levels. Um, and it really helps ensure that um, our response is, is adequate. So for instance, as a humanitarian worker, I can be working with uh, a few households to uh, individuals who've lost their livelihoods to help them set up a small shop, a uh, small business. But if in that process, I, for example, um, get uh, training on value chain development methodology, which, which, is, which comes a lot from the development sector, say by, I don't know, an ILO, for instance, um, then I can ensure that uh, I'm not only helping those individuals, but also uh, trying to strengthen the local market system. Um, that value chain development methodology might also tell me that I might not need only a couple of small grants. I might also need to see about that bridge over there that keeps being damaged because of the fighting and, and interferes with the, with, the, uh, with the communication line, the flow of goods um, into that area. And so I might you know, bring in my protection colleagues and, and embed that as part of our dialogue with the armed groups. So it, it makes a, a more comprehensive approach. Likewise, conversely, if a, human, if a development actor is working with the government to strengthen um, aspects of the social protection system, for instance, uh, they may want to engage with humanitarian actors who can tell them if the criteria, the administrative procedures, um, the, the legal framework might create situations where if a crisis hits, the system might not be able to um, absorb a new caseload quickly enough or might be able or might might leave these people behind. Uh, so I think these are all mindset issues that can be addressed by um, investing a bit more in knowledge exchange. And then on process, um, I think that's also relevant. And it's uh, I guess we need to acknowledge that that crisis always comes back. Um, and that's not necessarily a failure of the system. It's it's just it happens. Uh, COVID was a crisis that happened on uh, on that came to, to all of us. Uh, the question is how you know what are the consequences? How dire are the consequences? And so I think it's really important to to think about crisis as something that can can come back. Think about preparedness, um, and this means also we think the way we 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 talk about sequencing as well. Sometimes there's sequencing in uh, reverse, uh, where a development um, asset is handed over to a humanitarian actor because the situation deteriorated. And so uh, how do we prepare for that in terms of information and things like that? Sometimes the sequencing is delayed uh, and there needs to be transparency uh, where a humanitarian actor may be doing something on a transitional basis and hope, you know, waiting for the others to come in. And we need to have that, that uh, visibility of how long it will take, even if it takes longer than we thought, and, and bring in donors on that. Um, there's also pre-crisis partnerships that are in increasingly important for, for this preparedness. Um, uh, I mean, things that can be done before a crisis that can make them the crisis less uh, less intense. Um, and on this, uh, if I may just do a, a little um, advertisement, there's a, a very interesting uh, piece of research done recently, published recently uh, by the World Bank, ICRC and UNICEF on the resilience of water and sanitation systems. 
uh, looking at the experience in the MENA region. And there's many interesting challenges that were unpacked in that, in that research. Um, one of which, for instance, just an example, is how um, if you regulate um, the, uh, the alternative water service provisions, so water tankers, tankers, for example, before a crisis, it might help mitigate um, challenges around aggressive competition that undermine then the public uh, the public service provision during the crisis. So this is something that development actor is well placed to do, but for which um, a humanitarian um, uh, expertise might might also be useful. But that needs to happen before, and those dialogues don't always happen before uh, post crisis partnerships as well um, are are important um, so that we build back better. So again, if I stay with the example of water systems, a humanitarian actor would have seen how the water system um, lived or not through the crisis. So uh, might be able to have important information and expertise to give for reconstruction in terms of, you know, how do you build back better? How do you ensure that there's no single point of failure in case a crisis hits again? Um, so I guess the bottom line is about embedding methodologies in each other's um, thought processes and programmings um, and and being being pragmatic about preparedness and the fact that um, crises come back and there's a lot that we can do to mitigate the effects and then reduce needs and that's also the point of the nexus yes indeed it is yeah and, and i guess some of these examples around pragmatism and knowledge exchange you know the the practical experience that you that you've raised around uh, understanding water systems between uh, the World Bank and UNICEF and and Red Cross they become crucial in terms of getting to know each other I guess and and making sure mm -hmm. that that knowledge exchange leads to understanding and and I think maybe that's maybe at the heart of where we need to go we need to understand each other better um, and I think you know the I'm I'm, I'm going to chain reaction now to the to the next part of the panel because I think we do need to dig down into how we work with others how we work with each other and 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 really to do that we need to deepen our understanding so maybe you can you can pick that up with Rebecca to work out you know how are they working with partners how is it different how you're working um, so passing over to Rebecca and I'll see you a bit later thank you Hello, Rebecca. So I'm uh, I'm continuing the conversation with you, and I'd like to uh, circle back to to one of the points uh, men I mentioned uh, around the relationship with governments and unpack this a little bit with you, um, and and ask you how do we you know we all work with governments you know in various degrees in different ways um, depending on the context, but how can we better understand how we do that, how our relationships um, evolve over time? And if I could start by asking you um, how how it how it plays out um, with governments at different levels. So we tend to think of government as a single entity with one point of entry, but uh, in fact we engage at different levels. So can you can you explain what are the key dynamics at play there uh, from your perspective when working with different layers of of governments um, in fragile settings? Thanks, Philippa. It's great to be here. And I have to say, I really enjoyed your conversation before with, with you. Um, and the chance to unpack it and focus a little bit on government is, is interesting. It's important. I think for us, and if I look a little bit at um, the work of the program, we, we enter a country and we are, in, in fact, on an invitation. Right? So we are very much at the test of a government in order of protection. And we're there very much to support their efforts to achieve sustainable development goals, to achieve their national plans, to really strive forward. But most of the countries in which we're working are incredibly fragile. And if you look at those countries with the largest um, sort of food insecurity, those are conflict driven countries. There are countries where the drivers of conflict actually find that government is quite involved in the various dynamics and complexities around conflict. So it's quite important to look at a different level and to, in fact, understand how your relationships change across those levels. So for, for us at the national level, in terms of planning and supporting government, it's very critical to have that solid vision and, and to, to, in some ways, embody and promote those global standards. But if you look down at the local level, where much of our work is and where much of our program reaches, it's a very different story to national level. It's very 
good in terms of not just the dynamics and the challenges, but actually, as Natasha mentioned, when she was speaking about the manifesto and the beginning, that sort of decentralization, and in some ways, the level of government weakens as you get towards the local level. And where we step in is really in that support of basic services. So the dynamics around support and in fact, their ability to govern is weakened as you become more decentralized. And that changes the relationships. It changes our ability to support, and it also changes the types of programming that you provide. Um, it's also important in the context of conflicts to understand what else is in play. So if I look at um, many of the operations we're working with, in Afghanistan, Syria, or Congo, there are a number of different non-state armed groups that are also operating at a local level and that play into the dynamics and the relationships that we have with government. And they affect them because of course we're working to reach people wherever they are, whoever they are. Um, and that requires negotiation and relationship building that might be beyond just the government. So balancing that relationship so that you maintain a trust but also you're working to reach everybody is, is not so easy. Can I can I pick on this question of, of trust that you mentioned? Um, conflict dynamics, the situation evolves over time. Uh, the situation is often very fluid, so the relationship also evolves. Um, and so this relationship of trust, how far back does it go? Um, how does it evolve over time and, and how does it impact really in, on the program, programming, planning, financing uh, aspect of things? So I, I love this question, actually, because if you look back at the history of some of our organisations, I think all of us actually here on this, on this panel, um, our presence in the countries in which we operate span years, you know, 30, 40 years, in varying degrees of, of capacity, of course, but that speaks very much to a, our partnerships, because we must recognise that we're partnering with local communities, local organisations, cooperating partners, our international local NGOs, and, and those relationships, especially with the communities, build a level of trust and build knowledge as, as in a slightly different context to what he was mentioning previously, but they know us. If an organisation, if in a country they know you, your ability to work is completely different. And I think we find, especially for WFP, we're able to reach certain populations because they know us, and they know us because they trust us over a period of time. And that's very much this built on a very localized approach, localization in terms of partnership, but also in terms of working with the community over a period of time that sometimes, well, not sometimes, most of the time, sees the evolution of shocks. You know, it, a sudden shock can hit, they go back in terms of being able to recover, and then again a second shock. So this kind of constant recurrence of shots we stay with communities across this period of time. And the trust that's built there is, is I, find, I feel, absolutely fundamental to any of the programs we do. But something you did mention in three things that I want to try to touch on, which is the planning, the programming, and the financing. And it changes across different levels. But maybe if I start with programming, I feel that we have adapted our programming quite significantly over the last sort of 10 to 15 years. If we look at the landscape of when we were responding, for example, to the tsunami, and if we look at more recently the protracted complex um, conflict crises, our programming has shifted quite significantly. We've seen much more um, investment in the scale of cash and um, in terms of the connection of social safety nets and shock response of social systems, we've seen less of the delivery of, of just food aid, as it were, in terms of bags, um, although that is absolutely critical for certain emergencies. Um, and we've also seen a greater investment in industry action and the preparedness that you mentioned before, whether it's climate forecast based financing um, or whether. It's even technology, especially in terms of access. But what we perhaps haven't kept up is on the planning. And so on the 
funding, it's worth looking, for example, at the long-term response plans and um, UN development system plans and seeing whether they really are meeting the needs of populations and filling the gap in the team that is often along that spectrum of humanitarian and development assistance. Rebecca, Rebecca, hold your thoughts on planning. Could I just ask you please to switch off your camera because we're having trouble understanding you and I think it might help. Is that better? Okay. It is, it is. Great, sorry about you that. You were telling us about planning. No, we got the gist, but uh, but it was getting really difficult to follow. Go ahead, please. Thanks, Philippa. So planning in terms of the tools that we use across the system, I think in some ways programming has adapted to changing needs and the changing landscape of our response, but our tools still need to keep up. And that's something that in some ways I feel challenges us when it comes to the nexus in action. It sometimes draws us back. The ability to capture um, programming and humanitarian response plans but make that smooth link to transition work and development is not so clear when it comes to the tools that we have at country level. And on the financing side, you know, we often advocate for untied financing and want the flexibility to move and be able to meet people's needs. But I've also found, or we've also found through our work, that um, earmarked funding for, for certain areas is the only way that we are able to support in those areas. Often it's around risk, you know, often it's around gender and that critical lens of being able to reach the furthest behind. And having those earmarked funds to, to meet those areas of work are, are absolutely important. And then we often forget that the funding and financing that is absorbed when it comes to this program is entirely separate, for example, from overseas development assistance. So taking a step back and looking at a country as a whole and the support that goes to governments for the longer term, be it in loans or so on and so forth, we're not as holistic in our approach as we perhaps need to be when it comes to the process in action. I just wanted to mention those three areas because I find it absolutely important. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks for, for, for circling back to those very concrete planning, uh, programming and financing implications. That, that's very interesting and also, you know, for, for challenging us to, uh, uh, to, to think about how we do that. Minute left, I would say, and I wanted to um, ask a question that we've discussed a lot, the, the, you know, the two of you and with others, um, and just give me, you know, in a few seconds, your thoughts. So. Is it possible? I mean, we have humanitarian principles so that we can reach people um, in, in situations where, where the, the conflict dynamics are, are complicated. Um, and we have an important development principle around uh, government ownership and, and sustainability. Um, in, in, a, in a protracted crisis, can we have both? Or is it a trade-off in maybe just two seconds? In two seconds, Philippa. I believe that we can have both. It's not easy. And in many situations, it could be considered a trade-off. But I don't think it's mutually exclusive where we can be reaching the neediest that might be contrary to a national um, endeavor while still maintaining a relationship with the government with critical to our presence and our ability to respond. It is a fine balance. It's not easy and for organizations like WFP, we have a dual mandate. And it's also that issue of the principles themselves. You know, is there one that is more important than the other? Are they all equal? How can we pursue all in equal measure? So it's not an easy situation, but I, I do feel, and if I had more time, I'd like to give some examples, but I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I will now continue the conversation, pass it over to Hugh um, to continue the, uh, the, the conversation with Marta. I really thank you, Rebecca, for sharing your, your thoughts on these relationships with government that, that change over, and how it changes over time and affects our, our programming. Um, over to you, Hugh, to uh, get us to uh, a discussion on, on measurement. Thanks, Philippa, and, and good to be back. So it sounds like we need to change our mindsets, we need to change our processes. But even if we do that, I'm not sure, how, how do we actually know whether it's working? 
Um, and I think some of the challenges that we've also had around the Nexus is is measuring, measuring what that looks like, measuring whether it works. So, so maybe Marta, could you could you talk about your perspectives on on how do we how do we measure this better? How do we know whether we're getting it right? Do we need to do it collectively, or do we do it by ourselves? Thank you, and uh, and and thank you for the conversation and the question. So. I would like to start by um, sharing a thing that I think is quite important. Often, when we think about Nexus, there is a tendency to think about the Nexus as the end, as the objective. And we have to keep clearly in mind that Nexus is an approach. So we are speaking about an approach that should be helpful for us to end needs, for us to ensure that the population affected by crisis can realize rights to ensure that we can reduce vulnerabilities and we can further uh, help in uh, improving the management of risks. So the nexus per se is not, an an, is not an objective. And in order to define what is the right measurement approach, we need to be clear on what is the objective. And I th I'm saying that because I think that is quite an important thing. In the, over the last years, we have here a lot of questions about nexus programming and uh, it's not about nexus programming, it's about working across the nexus and agreeing on a common set of strategic objectives. And by having those common set of strategic ob objectives, we will be able to define the key questions that we want to answer and, uh, and that we want to measure in monitoring and evaluation systems. So I think that we need to go and step uh, before and discuss about how we reach those common set of objectives and therefore after how we set up the systems. I think that it is quite important. And, and we have been discussing a lot. I think that over the last years, we have seen a number of guidances and key documents that were developed in order to support practitioners on the field to implement the Nexus with a previous and initial step about common analysis to ensure that we can analyze and share uh, our intake on what is happening in the different context and as well to define this common set of objectives. Based on that, we can define questions. And, and Marty, you've led much of that work with, within the Interagency Standing Committee on, on, on that guidance on how we do that. But do we have the frameworks to do it where we need them in, at a country program level? Do, do people have the tools that they need? Do we, we put the guidance in place, but is that, do we have the frameworks to translate that into actual action? That's a very good question. I think that that links to the conversation you were having with uh, with Philippa. One question is the process and the other question is the mindsets. So mm -hmm. we have some initial processes and uh, the mindset, I think that there is some work being done in terms of adapting the mindset. In the resource group number four, we are doing now a mapping of good practices in the field. And what we have seen is that there are some advances in terms of having this common framework of analysis and share information. And there are initial steps in getting to this common set of indicators. So collective outcomes are starting to be a reality. However, I will say that we are still challenged on a number of fronts. The first one will be to ensure that these objectives are owned by all the different actors. We are not speaking about a reduced set of actors. We are speaking about uh, governments. We are speaking about local organizations, international and national NGOs, UN, we are speaking about donors, we are speaking about institutional finance, we are speaking about private sector. So this collective ownership is quite important. And then the second thing is to ensure that these common set of objectives are drilled down and are more pragmatically embedded into the programming and the projects. And we yeah. still see that there is work to be done. There are good practices, I will say, and there are interesting initiatives. I can mention some of them so uh, we have, um, there is a platform, for example, in Somalia, that is called the Somali-led Nexus platform with a number of local organizations that join up in order to work in coordination with government and synchronize some of the work they're doing to, in, in terms of the different pillars of the Nexus. Um, we have interesting initiative in Chad where we are, uh, the clusters are working locally on different initiatives in order to define with all the actors implicated collective outcomes and implement them. And we have as well donors launching initiative of coordination to try to see how they can further incentivize the work uh, across the nexus. There are advances, but we still need to go. In the mapping of good practices that we are running, um, 
it is quite clear that there is a need to further develop programming around these collective uh, objectives. There is work to be done in order to ensure that finance and funding is incentivizing those approaches. And there is as well work to be done in terms of the mindset, in terms of clarifying and ensuring that we are all on the same page about what do we mean. And even if we get that that shared ownership and we get that we're all on the same page, as you say, what you're describing, you know, inevitably leads to more mutually mutually interdependent programming as well. Um, you know, we all need to be doing our part at the right time in the right space uh, together. How do we ensure that that we do that? How do we hold each other to account in, in that sort of situation? Because I've seen collective outcomes, uh, programmatic sort of plans, but but who is making sure that we that we all do our respective bit in that? That's a good question. I think that uh, there is a key piece that is about setting the right accountability systems. Yeah. And to yeah. the question of the accountability systems, there are two sides to this question. There is one side that is the more technical one that goes to the key questions, that goes to define collectively what we want to measure. And we have to keep in mind that less is, is more, so that we need to get a focus, that we need to focus on what are the needs that we are going to be tracking, what are the rights that we want uh, to support in the realization, and what are the vulnerabilities. And we need to define system based on what we have in the country and ensure that those systems are helping us in terms of knowledge management, that they are shared, that are owned by all the different actors working uh, across. I think that there is one essential aspect is that we need to be better at listening to the affected population. It's not enough to have systems and tracking how vulnerability is evolving if we are not bringing the voices of the population into the scene and they need to be central. Yeah, And there, I feel that there is a lot of work to be done. But there is another part of the question that is more political and is more structural and is about what are the structures, who own the system and to whom this system is accountable. What is the role of the government? What is the role of the UN agencies? How the organizations and local organizations are part of that? And that means a different approach and a different uh, system of trust, but as well of letting go. So we have to be very clear, every organization have their own accountability system. And in general terms, we are all accountable to a lot of different bodies. So I think that the system, if we want to work across the nexus and be more accountable, we need to agree, we need to let go some of the existing systems in order to build a common one that in addition is going to help us be more adaptive, that is going to track advances that we will be able and we should celebrate but as well that is going to track what is not working well for us mm. to be adapting. Mm. So, so you mentioned mindsets, structures, adaptability, but, but I, I hear you talk about politics in there as well. So maybe, maybe we could move on to sort of talking about w w what's the politics of all of this? That's a very good point, because I think that uh, as in every interaction, power is at the center. So change in behaviors and changing ways of working is about balancing or changing the power dynamics. So, and all the different actors that are involved in development, humanitarian and peace, have their approaches to power. If we want to build something together, but that is respectful of mandates, is respectful of principles, we need to be very clear about those power dynamics. And we need to be very clear on what does it mean to have a shared system does it mean that all the organizations are going to be accountable to one? Or does it mean another type of power relationship that we need to build together? I think my perception is that it means the second, and that requires a lot of work around collaboration, coordination, and decision making. And until the moment we will be able to crack those dynamics and those structures, we will still have a way to go in order to be able to measure and say anything about how we work working together, we are contributing to those schemes. So, so let's, let's then talk about engaging politically, because that's my understanding of, of, of what you're talking about here. Yeah. <laughs> so then I have several questions for you about yeah. engaging politically. Yeah. Well, I, I can ask them back to you as well, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I will be happy to answer as well. <laughs> but I think that's uh, what I can say. And then because I think that is a nice transition to the questions that I have for you in this uh, reactive chain, 
is that I think that uh, we need to change as a sector. I think that it is the moment to change or to be irrelevant. And I think that in order to change, we need to be able to speak about power. And in some instances, speaking about power is perceived about is perceived as something negative. And I don't think that is negative. I think that there is a question about building power uh, among us and with all the different uh, actors. But it is challenging. It is challenging because there are questions related to space, presence, and uh, truth, truth, true collaboration and trust. And that takes time. And this is what I think that we are impatient in terms of seeing what are the changes. And this is why we bring constantly the question of measurement. Mm. I mean, going back to, to uh, the earlier conversation with Philippa and, and listening to Philippa and, and Rebecca talk, I mean, what, what struck me from that conversation is that actually we do all engage politically. Uh, you know, all of what we do, we work in in highly political and politicized environments. And of course, we engage politically. But it, but it, it strikes me that we maybe need to understand that the, that we work politically in, in, in different ways. And we, we, we probably need to uh, build up that knowledge of why we engage politically in different ways. I mean, development is, is not impartial. We pick winners as, as, as development actors. We, we pick winners, whether it's a political system or an economic system. Uh, we pick particular governments or state authorities to work with um, because we recognize them as, as, as duty bearers and having responsibility to their, to their citizens. Um, and that's arguably even more the case for peace actors in terms of picking winners. But, uh, but it does look different, it strikes me, across the three the three pillars of the of the nexus, if you like, how we work politically. But that's a very good question. Let me uh, ask you, because you were discussing with Philippa about principles and you were mm. discussing about mandates and priorities and approaches and how the different <coughs> actors are approaching these aspects. And I think that if there is an area of the nexus where it becomes a little bit challenging mm. is, uh, is when we are in a conflict context. And when there are there are political challenges and the context is fluid and uh, with recurrent peaks of crisis, I would like to get from your perspective about how the different actors are operating with these principles of uh, getting engaged in the political agenda. And what is your view about trades off between humanitarian principles, for example, and getting more engaged in the political discussions in order to reach a good degree of influence? Hmm. I mean, I, I certainly found Philippa's point uh, resonated with me in terms of thinking about principles and approaches as tools that we all use in a in a in a in a toolbox, if you like, which is really the nexus approach to to where we're aiming for the right thing. But I think, you know, you mentioned trade offs, and I think even recognizing that that different ways of working do have trade offs. Uh, you know, using principles has a trade off, uh, but I think we probably need to be more nuanced in the way in which we work in, in different contexts. And, you know, for humanitarians, humanitarians are quite nuanced, actually. You know, the, humanitarian is impartial and neutral, but you see in disaster scenarios where, uh, where they are meeting needs of people who are affected by disasters, by impacted on by natural hazards, they are engaging with the government. In fact, the, the Red Cross movement is, is at, a, at a national society level, is an auxiliary to government, normally legislated as a, as a government auxiliary. So I think we are seeing that flexibility in many ways in the humanitarian pillar, even though they might all, not always articulate it like that. But I think we struggle more on the development side, maybe. And I think... Uh, you know, for us as development actors, we've for a long time seen seen the the state or government as our as our main client, um, and maybe we need to revisit that and think about what does that look like in 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 complex emergencies and in and in in places where where we have an obligation now. We've always had an obligation, but with the nexus, we have even more of an obligation to stay and deliver. Um, and implement these longer term programs in crisis context. How do we do that if the client, if, if the government is not our, our, our major client anymore? How do we partner with government? So I think probably on the development side, we, we, we maybe need, need a more a nuanced approach and we need to understand for us what a people centered, uh, what a people centered approach looks like, I guess. 
that's a very good point because in general terms, when we speak about Nexus approaches, a lot of humanitarian actors, especially those that are not multi-mandated, mm. uh, raise the need to safeguard humanitarian principles. And in some context, uh, is we have seen a number of humanitarian actors raising a concern about engaging uh, in political dialogue that could be perceived as challenging the humanitarian principle. Do you think that we can overcome those challenges? I, I think so. Well, as I said, I mean, to, to be honest, I see humanitarians working more pragmatically with their principles mm. than, than maybe is sometimes perceived. And I think probably the, the, the greater challenge is maybe on the development side where, where we need to work out how we work in partnership with governments because, because development needs to be nationally owned, it needs to be sustainable, it needs to build self-reliance. But in those situations where it's, it's, it's challenging for us to, to have a main partnership with the, with the government, how do we become need-centered? How do we stay and deliver in those contexts? And I think, I think we're on that journey, but I think there's probably some way to go. And I think, you know, maybe to sort of bring this discussion a little bit to an end, I think, you know, the, this, this, we need to think about mindsets and think about who we are, who we work for, and then we think about the way in which we work um, to, to try to, to get this mind shift, mindset mm -hmm. shift and, and have the processes and systems that support that, that change of perspective. That's a very good point because I, I absolutely agree with you and it's about building on the strengths of the different actors. It is not about all of us being doing development humanitarian or peace. It's about preserving our knowledge, it's preserving our know-how, but being able to contribute based on the strength and the recognition of the strengths and the roles of everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Hugh. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to pass back to uh, to Henry. We were hoping to get Teton back uh, from Myanmar, but as you can see, there's uh, there are troubles with electricity, with internet. Um, so if he comes back, we'll bring him back. But in the meantime, I'll, I'll pass back to you, Henry. Thanks, Marta. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you very much, uh, Hugh and Marta. I mean, uh, one of our colleagues is saying that uh, she's not a, <laughs> a Nexus nerd, but that was a great exchange. I, I think I'm becoming a Nexus nerd. Uh, and so as a result of that, we want to have... Uh, Hugh and Marta back alongside uh, Rebecca and uh, Philippa and uh, Natasha as well, who talked to us earlier about Madagascar, because we want now to look at your questions and answers. I mean, you know, the nexus in action is what we're discussing here, opportunities and challenges in scaling up these uh, nexus approaches. And I'm pleased to say that um, questions are coming in and one or two of them are directed at particular uh, speakers. And this one is from Steve who says, uh, to Natasha in particular, opera, opera, uh, operational nexus requires joint analysis and planning. How do you convene actors on the field to undertake or contribute to joint analysis? So turning the nexus, the principles, into reality, how do you convene actors on, in the field to undertake or contribute to joint analysis? analysis. Uh, Natasha, what do you say to that? Uh, well, I say to Steve and uh, Henry, thank you. And Steve, thank you very much for the question. I think it's a, it's a really pertinent one. And it's not a small uh, undertaking, I would say. Um, certainly, you know, reflecting on the, the example of Madagascar, I think what, what has happened here is a, a very um, sure amount of consensus, I would say, on, on what it is that is happening in the suit, whether it is the humanitarian uh, situation or the structural, structural issues, sorry, that are driving it. Um, with regard to convening uh, the actors, um, I think it's a, I think it really is, a, there's, a, there's a lot of process in that and it's very heavy. We do have certain tools, uh, at least in the UN system, to try to bring uh, some coherent and joint analysis uh, around, and, and that comes through the, the cooperation framework and a common country analysis where the UN system, but also the system and its partners, so uh, bilateral actors, uh, state actors, national actors, uh, civil society are brought in to try to bring about some sense of common understanding uh, of what is going on. It's not a small task, I would say, and it's a, it's a fairly, fairly lengthy planning process in order to ensure that that is done in a 
in a way that is consistent with the principles of a nexus approach. But I would say that even beyond that, um, the planning aspect is also a really critical piece. I mean, we, we also have here a context where the, the risk is that uh, the conversation is driven by the capital. And I'm sure it's not just unique to Madagascar. We always have, you know, the, the convening power is always much more, it's easier and, and um, it happens more uh, fluidly at a centralized level. But I think there is a, a big question and further to the discussion earlier around how do you get the fields uh, involved in that and, and in that reflection, not only on do we all agree on what the common issues are and what our objectives are, but then how do we get to planning together, not just uh, at the central level, but involving field actors. So um, mm -hmm. not sure that I answered the question, but definitely a very pertinent one in terms of- I think you had um, a good, a lot, good of, go. a lot of process, yeah, thank you. I think you had a good go there, Natasha. And, um, well, there's uh, a bit of interest in Madagascar because this one is from Massimo. And you mentioned the Grand Sud, but um, Massimo wants to know more about opportunities to implement the nexus there. And is there a body that's pushing it or coordinating stakeholders in that, uh, that direction? Any f anything further to say on that? Yeah, another good question. I would say that, um, at least from my humble perspective, there's a fairly collective adherence to the principles around the nexus. There's a fairly common understanding, both within uh, the UN, but also bilateral actors and the government increasingly to say, it's not acceptable to keep re having recurring humanitarian responses when we know that there are fundamental problems at the basis uh, linked to drought, linked to lack of water in certain areas. That, that we need to address together. And so there's a certain um, collective uh, agreement around the importance and, and an acknowledgement that we can't permit ourselves to continue this cyclical um, approach to, to a humanitarian response. Um, is there a body, a specific body? I would say, I mean, certainly from, from where I'm sitting as a res rep of UNDP, UNDP, but the UN system is certainly pushing hard we might not necessarily use the terminology of nexus um, uh, as we do in internal conversations, but there's certainly a push and a drive and an attempt um, mm -hmm. to try to bring actors together here. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Natasha. <laughs> now, uh, Sigrid has sent in a couple of questions. Sigrid is very happy panelists with your contributions, with relevant points, which is good. But, uh, and this is, I suppose, to all of you, but I'll choose one of you. Uh, could you further elaborate on common systems that help to ensure a continuity of access to basic services across Nexus by population? So common systems. Let me see, who should go first? Philippa, how about you? <laughs> common systems. Um, I'd say, if I can, um, rather than common systems, I might share um, uh, examples of where there's been a continuity where, where systems have broken down um, or, or been affected by a crisis in a way that has left people behind um, and, and the role that maybe humanitarian action can, can play in that, uh, in that sense, um, whether it's part of a common system uh, you know, very clearly plan, planned and coherent from the get-go or not. I think this really depends on the country. But um, if I take um, a situation of, for instance, around social protection, uh, and I alluded to this example earlier, um, I think that crisis... Um, create new uh, groups of uh, new, new vulnerabilities and new groups of, of people who were not necessarily foreseen as needing um, uh, support in, in the sense of a social protection system and that suddenly find themselves in a situation of extreme vulnerability and that can happen quite quickly. Um, and so uh, what we've seen in a number of contexts is that um, very often there is a, a, a lag period in which um, uh, a lot of households can't access uh, the support that they need, but they could access it. They can't access it for administrative re reasons um, because they're out of scope in the legislation. Um, and so for us as humanitarian actors, there's a little bit this dual um, levels of action where on the one hand, we may provide a, a short-term 
um, support to these to these households so that they don't fall um, um, they don't lose assets that they they can they can keep up while at the same time engaging with uh, with the authorities to see how to um, cover those gaps uh, legally and administratively um, and so this is something that um, that we've done in places like Iraq uh, or Ukraine for example where the social protection systems had uh, needed a bit of time to adjust to a new caseload um, and the humanitarians had this um, added value of being able to bring to the attention of authorities um, particular communities that were being left behind. So this is something that happens, it, it, it's a good programming practice. Um, it, it, it wasn't necessarily part of a, a long-term plan, everything already um, well lined up. Uh, it was a, a situation that arose and, and people adjusted to it. Uh, but I think with making links with existing systems where it's um, relevant and where people themselves felt comfortable um, relying on, on existing systems um, yeah. is something that can happen quite organically um, and it worked quite well in these uh, situations. Fill the gap. Okay. Let me uh, throw that one to you, Marta, on common systems. Continuity of access to basic services. Mm, thank you, Henry. So um, building on what uh, Philippa has already said, I think that there are a number of initiatives. So I can mention one as well that is uh, in the case of Philippines. And, and this is an experience that we are supporting from Oxfam uh, very clearly. What we, we are trying to do is to ensure that the cash uh, system that we are putting in place is preemptive. So we know that in Philippines there are constant and recurrent uh, climate related uh, events. And we want to ensure that the population is relies and, and know that if there is an event, they will have some cash in order to get prepared. And as, as Philippa has said, what is quite crucial and important is for us to be supporting the national systems and the national social protection systems in order to be more shock responsive, to ensure that they are able to adapt in front of a shock, they are able to identify and to target the population that is facing these shocks. And I think that it can be done in, in very challenging con uh, context where the states will are having an existing system, but as well, what we are doing is in those places where we are doing cash distribution with a social protection approach, what we try to do is to ensure that we hand over the key information on the system, on how we target and on the results to the national government or the local government to see if they can adapt the system and they can maintain and sustain. So it's about, as, as we said during the conversation, it's about ensuring that we can bring some of the support that we do and link with actors that are having those pre-existing systems. And if they are not having those pre-existing systems, but they are the better seated in order to develop them, to ensure that we hand over the information and we support them with the knowledge and the experience that we have. Very good, Marta. I mean, and uh, there's a second part to Sigrid's a question, um, and I think you've answered uh, it substantially, um, because you asked if there were any good practices to share on continuity in terms of free health access, education, etc., or cash transfers, you mentioned, social protection systems while it's ensuring now. She's talking about data protection in conflict settings. Uh, Rebecca, any thoughts on that, on the second part of that question? Well, when it comes to data protection, Henry, I think it's it's critical because it applies, especially in fragile contexts, to whom we're reaching and where they are. Um, I, I wanted to build a little bit on what Marta and Philippa had said. And sometimes it's also a case where there isn't perhaps a system, but you can help put in place the system in the absence of one in a way that can then be transferred to a government and developing it in a way that it's shock responsive. And I'm thinking actually of Congo, in, even in, in Kinshasa, where the simple ability to identify needs and register people so that you can transfer from ad hoc basic services to something more systematic and could then sit on a national social protection platform is, is another sort of model that's quite important. And the issue of data protection connected to that is critical, which is why humanitarian agencies, if we are able to support the registration, identification of needs, protecting that information in a way that protects identities and does not sort of expose the vulnerability of populations is critical. And there are different ways, there are agreements, there are standards, 
between agencies as part of our nexus effort, but also with government that allow for that data protection. Excellent. I'm going to ask you about that, Hugh. Uh, any further examples to give um, on that second half of Sigrid's question? The con continuity in terms of free health access, education, um, social protection systems, but also, as Rebecca was saying, importantly, ensuring that people's uh, data is protected, especially in vulnerable situations. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it comes back to understanding each other better again. And it was, it was brought up uh, a few times during the panel. We do need to understand each other better because we need to understand uh, how to do sequencing. We need to understand better where there's added value in us working simultaneously uh, in a particular context, or, or we need to understand better where there is a point of transition where we move from really emergency crisis response to, to longer term efforts. Um, but part of the challenge that we have at the moment, and and you know, I, I don't want to keep focusing on the challenges, but but we, we still do have some challenges. I mean, in some contexts, we see that humanitarian action starts to crowd out some of the longer term development programming, and we need to address that. Um, and in some contexts, we're just not there as development actors. So uh, we're not being crowded out. We're not there in the first place. So we, it, for me, it does come back to understanding how we work together and, and then building on what, on what Philippa and Marta and, and Rebecca have said about doing our thing in such a way that it can be transitioned. I mean, social protection programs, absolutely, a, a case in point, you know, they're, they're, they're something that humanitarians know how to do, but they can be done in such a way that they become a sustainable national resource. Mm -hmm. We're getting a number of questions uh, coming in, uh, particularly on the YouTube chat, and you've got another 10 or so minutes, uh, friends, delegates watching from wherever you are in the world to put your questions. We've got this tremendous panel I don't want to carbon date them, but I would say between them, we've got a, an average of 25 or so years experience, both in the field, in headquarters, in policy and practice. Let's not waste it. Let's use this uh, dialogue and get questions put to them so we can get direct answers. And really please, we're getting more and more coming in. Uh, Philippa wants to quickly come in on data protection. Philippa, you can, and then I'll go to a question from Hugo, which is coming through YouTube. So Philippa, yes. Thank you, Henry. Now, I just wanted to very briefly pick up on the, the issue of data protection and, and echo very much the, uh, the importance of, of, this, uh, of this point, um, as mentioned by Hugo, by uh, Hugh and, uh, and Rebecca. Um, just to also point out that uh, in some of these social protection systems related um, activities, there are also, it's not just us, um, there are many, many actors, many intermediaries as well, where um, considerations of data protection are also relevant. Um, and it's also um, it's also important to um, understand that to hear communities, to hear how populations um, and, and households um, envision um, relying on social protection systems that uh, may be very government centered, uh, whether de facto it might create situations of exclusion or not, um, and, and hear them and, and try to make sure that there are. Oops. Ah, we've um, stopped you in your tracks, Philippa. Let's give it a second to see if the land, the line reconnects. If not, I'm going to go to Hugo's question. Give it a few more seconds because I know you are mid-flow and I don't want to interrupt your flow because you're about to land. No, I don't think. Okay. This is um, from Hugo who says, we know that gender inequalities are drivers of fragility and women's empowerment is key to the sustainability of our responses. Yes, amen to that. And yet... Nexus actors have not been traditionally very coordinated on gender work. What are the challenges and how can UNDP contribute to gender responsive approaches? Uh, Mart, I'm going to put that to you. I can speak about the gender approach. I cannot say what UNDP can do to... Uh, yeah. No, I know. I'll go to you for that in a second, but you first on this one. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, I think that there is a clear gap in terms of uh, addressing all gender-related challenges. I think that one important step is to ensure that we bring women's rights organization to the key conversations. So we discussed several times during the panel on the need to bring the voices of the population into the discussion. And I think that the best way is to ensure that women's rights organizations are part of the key conversations. And of course, to ensure that they are part of the analysis and they are part of the definition of the key objectives. So it's not a question about 
uh, nexus actors. I think that the nexus what wants is to bring all the different actors into the discussion to ensure that we can tackle and that the different programming uh, frameworks can tackle what are the key challenges. N gender uh, is one of the key aspects. It's not only because of the gaps and the challenges that are faced by women, but it's about the role of women and how important they are in all the different dynamics and, and the power they have. So I think that it is about bringing them into the conversation is by ensuring that the analysis are gender sensitive and that the objectives include gender or that we have a specific objective on gender. I think that there is a lot of work to be done and, um, and it's about generating sensib sensibilities and it's about improving understanding and defining this common goal. Very good. Let me bring uh, Hugh in here. Um, is, it fair, is it fair for Hugo to say um, Nexus actors have not been traditionally very coordinated on gender work? And, and then if so, um, how can UNDP contribute to better, more gender responsive approaches, Hugh? Yeah, look, I think it's partially true. I mean, I, I'd, I'd maybe challenge the, the the concept of a nexus actor. We are all mm -hmm. who we are, and yeah. and the the point is to work in a in a more complementary, joined up, coordinated way. So, I, I slightly challenge the, the 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 concept of a nexus actor. But you know, at the heart of of a nexus approach is is really having a a shared understanding of risks and vulnerabilities in a particular context. And to be frank. Where the nexus really hits the road, which is in which is in protracted, conflict-affected type contexts, we all know that women and girls are disproportionately affected by those risks in in, in those sorts of contexts. That we, we we share that understanding, but we're not always all focusing on the same people at the same time. So I think if we if we do have much more joined up and and joint analysis. Um, and if we have joined up planning that is based on a common understanding of those risks and vulnerabilities, we will share that, that understanding that women and girls are more affected. Um, and that will then come through all of our programming uh, in, a, in a nexus approach, if you like. So, so it does come back down to this, this, this shared concept of risk and vulnerability. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we've got an endorsement here from another um, viewer, uh, another delegate, as it were, who says... Uh, it will help us ensure our individual mandates and activities are aligned in a strategic manner despite a very volatile environment. So he's saying, yes, I approve. That's from Pierre. I'm not sure which organization Pierre is from. So, so, uh, so uh, thank you very much for that, for that Pierre. Um, Natasha, uh, would you like to respond to that? Vote of confidence from Pierre? Yeah, um, I would say that... Uh... I would say that I fully agree. Uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, it does take a certain amount of reflection and effort and will on the part of actors that are already working in, in, in sometimes very volatile contexts and, you know, emergency responses, uh, it, it does take that going that extra um, mile, uh, so to speak. But, but I think that that is exactly the point and, and it does help us to be collectively more effective. So uh, fully agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let me put this one to you, Rebecca. Um, now this is a question from me, just having listened to your back and, back and forth during the train reaction. I get the sense that there's a need to discuss power. I think, Martha, you might have mentioned this power, <laughs> you know, who, who wields it and who yields it in any given situation. You know, that there can be a development uh, presence somewhere, then there's a, a, a real crisis, um, humanitarian crisis. We've got to get the humanitarian people in. The development people may melt away or they may insist on staying in some degree, but then you get this tension and back and, back and forth. Uh, talk to me honestly about power. Who wields it and who yields it? And do you need to be more honest about it, Rebecca? I think I need to be more honest about it as Please. a humanitarian de development organisation. But you're absolutely right, Henry. I mean, we do need to be a bit more honest about it. And I think you're touching on something quite sensitive to all our organisations. I think at different levels, we spoke about different levels in the country when it comes to relationships with government. But different organisations yield different powers with 
those relationships. And that can be both with people that we're trying to reach, but also with the national actors and governments. And I think it's important that we're sensitive to that. But I also think it's important that we strip down mandates and really focus on the one common concern, which has to be around improving the lives of the people. And if we do focus on that, the power issue becomes less and less relevant. And there is much more collaboration, I feel, and more possibilities of it when you strip that away. Hugh mentioned in the previous comment, um, joint analysis as a basis for joint programming. And it strikes me that when it comes to the issue of gender sensitive programming, I don't know how many programs you'd see WFP and UNDP jointly collaborating. And underlying that is not just the humanitarian development spectrum that sort of underpins the Nexus conversation, it is also that issue of power and where do we sit and presence and how that also that influences the resource, is influenced by resourcing, sorry. So it is, it is very important. And I think it's interesting that it's the first time we've used that term in some of the Nexus conversations. We probably cover it up with other great, fantastic UN terminology, but it underpins a lot of the tensions and challenges that we face. Uh, Rebecca, I think your conversation has triggered uh, Philippa, because she co she wants to come in on power. Maybe she wants to yield some. Maybe she wants to grab some. Philippa, over to you on behalf of the ICRC. Uh, thanks, Henry. And I, and I apologize for my connection problems. I hope this, okay. uh, this time it will work out. Um, I did want to come, uh, on this, come in on this question of power and already hearing the conversation between Marta and Hugh, a lot of things came to mind. I once was asked by someone who was, uh, I think, doing a master's thesis on, on uh, or a PhD on the Nexus, uh, who the Nexus is accountable to. And I found that question quite interesting. Um, and the immediate answer that came to my mind was to affected people. Um, and I think we, uh, in discussing about power uh, relation, and I think it's good to put the, that word on the table, um, we, it's important to also acknowledge that there is a lot of good practice that is happening where operations are closest to the to affected people uh, because they're responding to 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 needs that are very um, that, that are very real to situations and capacities that people have that are very evident um, and so there is good programming practice uh, happening on the ground and I don't want to over romanticize um, uh, colleagues working in, in in affected countries but we, we we see this time and time again and then it's only when the conversation goes to a higher level that the rigidities come in. Um, and so I think there's something there about um, t being able as institutions to take more uh, the cue from, from, um, from colleagues who are working closely with affected populations, because very often the, the, they are making an effort, an honest effort to um, connect with whoever they need to connect across boundaries, across mandates, to, to find a, a way to better support um, the people because they're, they're, they're right there. Excellent. We're coming toward the end of our chat today on uh, the Nexus in Action. Um, I want 30 seconds from just one of you on whether or not the Nexus approach is making a difference, making an impact. I'm just looking at all of you now, all five of you. Now I'm just looking at the person who looks most eager and most keen to sum that up and to answer in 30 seconds, let me see. It's Martha, without a doubt. I can see your teeth and you're smiling. So how much of a difference is it making? How confident are you that this can be scaled up effectively? I am confident that it can make a difference. I think that we still have a way to go in order to ensure that this is real. Wonderful. You took just about 12 seconds. Oh, oh, and <laughs> Hugh wants to come in with just 10 seconds. Because yeah, of uh, Marta coming in on time and on budget, you can have 18 seconds. I only need 10. Uh, uh, is it making a difference? Yes, I think it is. Uh, it, it, it's, it's more difficult than we thought, but I think it's making a difference. But what I would say is it's inevitable. We can't keep working the way in which we've been working. And you can see everybody on the screen nodding their head. The reason that we're doing this is because we know it hasn't worked well enough. Um, so it's inevitable. We need to make it work because what we have been doing is not good enough. And we have a commitment to reach the furthest behind, to reach the furthest behind first, to eradicate poverty, to end crises. And we're not going to achieve it without making the nexus work. 
Tremendous. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm going to give you some closing thoughts. I mean, just pulled from the conversations today. Well, development is not impartial. We've heard that. Power needs to be discussed honestly about who wields it and who yields it in any situation. And trade-offs between various principles in the sector needs to change so that we can all win, as in the people win, instead of just some and so that no one's left behind. That concludes our session on the Nexus in Action. I'd like to thank our speakers, Philippa, Rebecca, Marta, Natasha, Atiton, for when we had him, and, and Hugh. The Development Dialogue series continues throughout this month and will culminate in a final session, Development Solutions for Crises, The Way Forward, on the 1st of July, that's 8 a.m. to 9.30 um, a.m. New York time. And that would be, I think, 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. That would be uh, Geneva time or Central European time. Okay, so new development, solutions for crisis, the way forward. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. And panelists, thank you once more. Look forward to joining you next time. Thank you very much indeed. And stay safe.